thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, what an incredibly impressive group. Um, I hope uh, you and your families are all well, and I hope that the science fiction movie we all seem to be stuck in is not treating you too badly and that the next episode is better than this one. Um, but mainly, we're all thrilled that uh, you're here and interested in bringing the idea of OpenDP to reality. So what is OpenDP? Our vision of OpenDP inclu includes four parts. It includes open source software that's owned by all, publicly validated and trustworthy. It, it involves a community that works on deciding what validated and trustworthy means in this, in this case. Um, it involves a set of institutions to support the software building and the community. So far, we have Harvard's privacy tools, uh, a project at the, uh, at, uh, the Harvard uh, Engineering School that Salil leads. We have Harvard's Institute for Quantitative Social Science that I lead. The Sloan Foundation has provided very generous financial support. We've had a great collaboration with Microsoft at this early stage, which has provided some terrific people and great use cases and lots of energy. Um, and most importantly, we have everyone here today. Um, th those are the first three. The fourth one is a proposed new di intellectual direction for the field. Uh, traditionally, scholars tend to pick one thin slice on the continuum from abstract mathematical theory to practical application. We instead propose that scholars engage or at least understand the whole continuum. Uh, theorists can develop new directions from the novel needs they see in applications. Those with applications can learn from theorists that they have options they didn't even know about. Um, if more of us engage that entire continuum from theory to practice, we think that with OpenDP, we will see rapid and widespread usage in real applications across academia and industry and government, and together we will all create enormous public good. So let me tell you about one application that brought us to propose the OpenDP project in the first place, our, our first discussions. Um, uh, so I'm a social scientist, and the goal of the social sciences is to understand and solve the problems that affect human society. We do, to do this, we need data, data on the subject of our study, people and their groups and organizations and companies and societies. Well, we have more data than ever before, and that's created spectacular progress. But although the social sciences have more data than ever before, we have a smaller percentage of the data in the world about the subject that we study than ever before, because most of it is actually locked up inside private companies and inside governments. So the question is how to get that out. In fact, one of the key issues is that in, in preventing the data from coming out is customer privacy, the privacy of the people that we're trying to study. That often prevents data sharing. What happens now is that people talk about when they're negotiating, they talk about balance, the balance of the needs of customers and, and citizens and the business with the needs of researchers and the public good. That balancing doesn't always come out in our favor. We want to use differential privacy to avoid the balancing act. I want to use it as a technological solution to the political problem of data sharing. So no balancing is necessary. So to give you um, a feel for this, I want to give you another example outside of DP, outside of differential privacy, of a technological solution to a political problem, just to give you a feel for um, what one good application. And it's how we convinced Facebook to make data available to researchers. So I'm just going to tell you the story. So here's how it worked. I was visiting Facebook, as I had many times, to try to per persuade the company to make data available. One of, one of many visits. They, they said, they'd think about it. You know, that, that's usually where I got. Um, and, and I'd been there lots of times, so fine. I, I started going home, I went to my hotel room, and I'm in, literally in my hotel room packing, and I get an email from my friends at Facebook, and it says, um, what do we do about this? And this was Cambridge Analytica. So that means that basically I had the worst timed lobby event pretty much in the history of the world. <laughs> so I went home. <laughs> um, fortunately, three days later, they called me and they said, hey, Gary, could you do a study of the 2016 election and show everybody that we didn't change the outcome or maybe if we did something wrong, tell us what it is and we'll, and we'll fix it really fast. You know, losing $100 billion in market cap sort of focuses the mind. Um, and they really wanted to do the right thing. Um, so I, I thought about it and I said, oh, I'd love to do this study of the 2016 election, but I need two things and you're only gonna give me one. So the two things are complete access to the people and the processes and the data 
like all the employees get, right? The employees get access to all the data that they need to do their work, but I need a second thing. I need no pre-publication approval of what I write. Because if you get to veto what uh, results, if you don't like them, then nothing I actually am allowed to publish would have any scientific value at all. So we need, I need those two things. And so I was talking to Facebook, to, to Mark actually, and he said, well, you're right, I'm not gonna give you those two things. And I said, well, okay, that's fine. I'm not gonna do the study. So he said, no, no, I really want you to do the study. I said, well, okay, give me those two things. I said, he said, no, I can't give you those two things. I said, well, so we went back and forth like that a, a number of times until finally I realized, wait a second, there's a solution to this. It's a, it's a technological solution to a political problem, but the technology here was a constitutional solution. I'm a political scientist, so we, we think about these things. So instead of giving me act data access and pre no pre-publication approval, we'll create two groups of people and we'll give each one of them one of those things. So one of them was outside academics who propose to study very specific things. They ask to study specific things, just like if you get data from governments, you have to say what it is you're gonna study. If approved by a process I'll describe in a second, for the first time ever, they would have no company veto. No, so they, there would no, be no pre-publication approval as long as they studied what it is that they were proposing to study. So who decides? Not the company, actually. A trusted third party, a commission of senior distinguished academics at a, an organization we set up called Social Science One. You can see it on the web, socialscience.one. Um, uh, we set up that institution directly for that, for that purpose. It's now part of IQSS. Um, that organization, um, uh, or the people in the commission uh, at that organization sign NDAs, agree not to publish on the basis of the data, so they sort of take one for the team. They choose the data sets they, that are appropriate. They, they stand up for the academic community and say those are legitimate data sets. They stand up for Facebook, and if, if there was a lawsuit uh, uh, that was not public and, and it was about a subject that was meritorious, we would not approve research into that because the, re the researchers would be deposed for the next two months and that, that clearly wouldn't work for Facebook either. So, so that actually solved the problem. Um, we solved the problem without balancing the same way differential privacy is going to solve the problem for us. There were agreements, announcements, funding, more than 30 people were assigned uh, from Facebook to the problem. It was really great. It was just one issue. It turned out that Facebook's implementation plan for how to actually do this was according to regulators, well, illegal. So we had a new problem. <laughs> uh, and that is, how do we share data without it actually leaving Facebook? That's what we had to figure out. How do we do that? So we, we then worked on solving that problem and it turned out differential privacy was the technological solution to this, pol this political problem. It avoids balancing and it convinced the regulators that, that it was okay for us to study study these data. We gave both sides what they wanted. Uh, we've now shared a differentially private data set with researchers on the effects of social media on elections and democracy. We processed an exabyte of data, a quintillion bytes, and released a data set to social science researchers and, and others um, with 10 trillion cell values. It's probably the largest social science data set ever made available to, to social scientists um, ever. So. Um, Maybe it's the largest differentially private data set. I don't know. Um, in any event, um, solving political problems is hard slogging, but with differential privacy technology, you all create things that make it possible for us to do stuff that were previously impossible. So finally, I want to I want to illustrate these points with the next step in the story. So differential privacy solves the political problem, and that's great. But gosh, you all create privacy protections by censoring or what you call clamping results and then adding noise. From a statistical point of view, we, we call that, um, that selection bias and measurement error. Uh, uh, and because we're making inferences beyond the private database to a population and censoring noise induce huge statistical biases, well known actually. So we absolutely cannot use the results you give us as is utility as measured in in large parts of the differential privacy literature has actually no utility for us. Um, of course, once we understand what you're doing, and so we communicate with you, uh, once you communicate with us, um, 
uh, we can fix the problem, right? From a statistical point of view, a scientific statement is not one that is necessarily correct. It is one with known inferential properties like unbiasedness and consistency and accurate estimates of uncertainty. Um, so if we, can, if we can fix these problems, once we, know, once we know the importance of these properties for applications for this particular application at that end of the continuum, uh, we can find ways of adding statistical validity to differential privacy and we can make it useful for us and give the theorists something different to, to focus on as well. Um, in other applications, there are other things needed that none of us would never have thought of or not necessarily have thought of ahead of time. So we call on the theorists here to get to know some of the applications in detail and some of the folks doing the applications. And we call on those interested in applications to get to know a theorist or two. So you can see the options you, would, you wouldn't have known about previously. And we call on everyone to join this OpenDP community to help us build trustworthy open source software available to everyone. So thanks again very much for coming. Um, let me now give you one of the clearest and most insightful thinkers I know in this field, which is Salil Vadhan. He is the Vicky Joseph Professor of Computer Science and Applied Mathematics. Um, that's a pretty cool title, but he was also recently appointed Harvard College Professor and is uh, co-faculty director of me of OpenDP. Salil. Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, as Gary said, I'm Salil Vadhan, a uh, faculty member here at Harvard and co-director of OpenDP together with Gary. And let me start by echoing Gary's thanks to all of you for joining us in spite of the circumstances of the pandemic and also wishing you and those dear to you continued health and safety. In my remarks, I'd like to give you an overview of the motivation for OpenDP, its elements that we'll be discussing in more detail in the rest of this workshop, the timeline for the effort and how you can engage. We have a number of attendees who are from outside DP community for example, representing use cases in the open so source software community. So let me begin with a very quick review of the motivation for differential privacy. In the appendix of the OpenDP white paper that was posted on our website a couple of days ago, you can find a pointer to a longer primer on differential privacy. Differential privacy seeks to enable statistical analysis of data while pro providing privacy protections for individual level data. So what do we mean by statistical analysis? This includes things like publications of statistical tables, training machine learning models, generating synthetic data sets that reflect statistical properties of the original data. Those familiar with differential privacy will notice that here in this slide uh, depiction, and indeed in the near term for OpenDP, we are focused on the centralized model, where there's a, a curator that is trusted to hold all the sensitive data and perform releases. Such a curator may also field queries from external analysts allowing them to perform custom, not previously anticipated analyses, like running a regression on, a variable, on variables of their choice. Statistical query systems are already in use by both government agencies and in industry as a means for allowing the public to study sensitive data. In the bottom right, uh, you'll see a Google Trends query on the terms differential privacy. And I'll proudly note that Massachusetts comes out on top of US states for this query. So that's the kind of utility we aim to provide, why do we need differential privacy? The reason is that traditional methods for protecting privacy are now understood to be inadequate and are vulnerable to worrisome attacks. Starting with this work of Sweeney, there are now numerous examples showing that removing so-called personally identifying information often leaves data sets still vulnerable to re-identification, where an adversary can use auxiliary data sources to still determine who is who. Even more surprisingly, releases of what appear to be simply aggregate statistics can be sub subject to severe database reconstruction attacks where an adversary reconstructs almost all of the sensitive data from the released numbers or membership inference attacks where an adversary can determine with high statistical confidence whether someone is in a sensitive data set or a subset of it. These attacks don't tell us that all hope is lost, only that we need to be very careful even with allowing only statistical analysis, and we need a theory to guide us in understanding what is safe and what is not. That is what differential privacy promises to offer. It gives a way of being sure that individual level information cannot leak when releasing statistical information and is increasingly accepted as a very strong gold standard for privacy protection. The way it achieves this is by carefully injecting small amounts of random noise into statistical computations to hide the effect of each individual data subject 
while still allowing signal about the population or larger groups to come through. So it does come with a cost and accuracy, but there is now a huge literature showing that differential privacy is compatible with almost all forms of statistical analysis, at least in theory or asymptotically. Here's a partial list that I made six years ago, and the literature has only exploded in size since then. In addition to lots of advances in the science of differential privacy, we have seen a number of exciting deployments, starting with the US Census Bureau back in 2006, which recently also made the landmark decision to use differential privacy for all its public use products from the current decennial census. There are also several products and tools using differential privacy from large tech companies like Google, Apple, and Microsoft. And these are all well-resourced organizations with lots of technical expertise to build specialized differential privacy systems for their own use cases. Unfortunately, it's currently still difficult for smaller organizations to build differential privacy solutions on their own, and wider adoption has been slow. From the research community, there have also been many wonderful advances in differential privacy tools, but these often stop at being research prototypes that are built by one group, don't integrate with tools built from other research groups, and don't, often don't make the transition to ever being trustworthy production code. So with OpenDP, we want to initiate a community effort, a community effort to build a trustworthy and open source suite of differential privacy tools that can be easily adopted by custodians of sensitive data to make it available for research and exploration in the public interest. Why? Well, what excited me most about OpenDP is the idea of bringing this community together to channel all of the advances we are making on the science and practice of differential privacy. By working together, we can build software that is more trustworthy, provides greater utility, and has larger impact. We can foster greater adoption of differential privacy to address compelling use cases. And we can provide an advanced starting point for custom differential privacy solutions where they are needed. In the other direction, as Gary discussed, I believe this effort, effort will uncover many important and fundamental new research questions for our field. We envision the OpenDP software to be divided into an OpenDP Commons, and a number of different OpenDP systems. The commons will be the community governed portion of OpenDP, containing the core library of differentially private algorithms, as well as other general purpose tools and packages. The OpenDP systems will consist of end to end differentially private systems that will usually be built in a partnership to address a particular set of use cases um, and govern more independently. The system we've been building in partnership with Microsoft, which you'll hear more about later, is an example of such a system. By definition, the OpenDP systems will make use of components from the OpenDB Commons once it exists. And conversely, we expect that the efforts to build these systems will, will result in new and improved general purpose components to be contributed back to the Commons subject to community vetting. The key elements we see for OpenDP are the following. For use cases, we are focused on opening otherwise siloed and sequestered sensitive data to support scientifically oriented research and exploration in the public interest, including data shared from companies, from government agencies, and research data repositories. The goals of our governance model include ensuring that the software is trustworthy, in particular has correct and secure implementations of differential privacy, that the software continues to develop rapidly and serve the overall mission, and that all important stakeholders are heard. The programming framework for the core library of differentially private algorithms in the OpenDP Commons should enable the library to expand with the rapidly advancing science of differential privacy, while still ensuring the trustworthiness of code contributions and enabling the design of efficient, high utility OpenDP systems. The OpenDP software must provide statistical functionality that is useful for the researchers who will analyze it. In particular, and related to what Gary's uh, one of Gary's points, it is crucial that the library of differentially private algorithms exposes measures of utility and uncertainty that will help researchers avoid drawing incorrect conclusions due to the noise introduced for privacy. The OpenDP software must integrate seamlessly with the storage and compute infrastructures arising in use cases in order for the deployed systems to provide secure, efficient, and usable realizations of differential privacy. And OpenDP must develop fruitful collaborations with other groups in academia, industry, and government that can contribute to software design and development, apply OpenDP tools to important use cases, and provide personnel and financial resources to support OpenDP. And last, but certainly not least, OpenDP must build a diverse, inclusive, and vibrant community who will be motivated to carry its mission far into the future. This meeting is the start of our building this community. 
The other six elements are the topics of our plenary talks today, the breakout sessions, and the sections of the uh, Open DP white paper that's available on the project website. From the time that's left, let me tell you where we are in this project. Last spring, I first pitched this idea of OpenDP to the differential privacy research community during a semester on data privacy at the Simons Institute in Berkeley and got a very positive reception. So we went ahead and submitted a proposal to the Sloan Foundation, which generously um, granted us funding. And a few months later, our collaboration with Microsoft on building a differentially private system got started. In the fall, we convened an ad hoc design committee, bringing in external experts, Marco Gabuardi, Michael A. Hay, Alexandra Korolova, and Ilya Mirinov, several of whom you'll hear from today, to help us plan OpenDP. We also started working on hiring our initial staff, like program director Annie Wu, who you just met, and our software architect, Mike Phelan, and continued to make progress on, the, on development with Microsoft. This spring, we fleshed out the details of the programming framework for the OpenDP Commons and the other elements I mentioned earlier. We are near to completing the first version of a differentially private system with Microsoft. And a fantastic and really diverse group of thought leaders have agreed to serve on the OpenDP Advisory Board. That brings us to today and this community meeting. Going forward, we are going to take all the feedback we get from this workshop and afterwards, um, absorb it and adjust our plans accordingly and get to work on building the OpenDP Commons. We'll also need to get a security review of the code in the Commons. We'll be looking to work with some folks who might be excited to join the team as application leaders driving effort to bring OpenDP to applications, such as contributing to the battle against COVID-19 or other pandemics. We also will establish our model for partnerships and start more collaborations. And we need to do some fundraising as we are already projected to be short of what we need for sustaining our core team. Come fall, we plan to launch the OpenDP Commons with a working code base uh, for the core library of differentially private algorithms and establish the editorial board and code committers to review contributions. We also plan to have the minimal, a minimal viable product of a deployable differentially private system coming out of the collaboration with Microsoft. This MVP will make use of the OpenDP Commons and will be integrated with the Dataverse data repository, which you'll hear about next. Along with all of these launches, we plan to have the second OpenDP community meeting. Looking beyond, we hope for continual growth in the functionality and applications of the software through community contributions, increased community governance through a steering committee, and sustainability through a community commitment to the project. How can you engage? Well, you'll hear more about our plans during the workshop and can read many more details in the white paper on the website. Hopefully most of you signed up for our mailing list when you registered, which will allow you to stay posted on our progress. But the main reason we are here and having this meeting is for communication in the other direction, to hear your feedback and suggestions. This will partly occur in the breakout discussions, but this is a large meeting with over 100 people registered for each breakout. So we may not be able to hear from all of you. So please do send additional email input by email afterwards and any time in the future. And as I just discussed, more ways to contribute, including eventually code and other forms of collaboration are on their way. We look forward to starting to get to know all of you during the next few days, at least as far as this online format allows, and hope you enjoy the workshop.